about accessibility 101 at UNCG. Right. Sam. Thanks, Jenny. So this is a uh, small-ish group. So like Jenny said, this to me is pretty casual. But today we are talking about accessibility at UNCG. Um, and I've done this session a couple of times. But as um, Jenny pointed out, um, there's new people here and also um, uh, there's some new stuff that I'm going to talk about towards the end at UNCG to help us all with accessibility um, in a lot of different ways. So here is a um, go link to the slides, which has a lot of the links I'm going to cover. And also you can follow along with me. It's not one of those slides that I don't mind if y'all go ahead, if that is what y'all need to do. Um, so so um, I think like all of y'all know me, so I you know, thought about not even adding an intro slide, but I did want to point out that um, as the online learning librarian, um, I do work with units across campus on a lot of things to do with library, um, sorry, with instructional technology, um, any kind of, uh, you know, instructional tech, tech that we would use within our teaching and learning environments, which means I work with the UTLC, ITS, um, academic ITCs, which are like at a department unit, UNCG online, um, and more um, on accessibility. I've been to a lot of trainings. Um, so because of that, because of like the meetings I attend, I get to hear a lot about a lot of stuff. So if there are any questions about what's going on around campus um, concerning this or other library instructional technology stuff or professional development for faculty um, and uh, instructors, just let us let let me know. And I can, if I don't know, I could at least could uh, get you in touch with the right person. So so today we're going to go over like the basics because again every time I do a session like this I just want to make sure we're all on the same page about some definitions and uh, the important stuff that's going on with higher education here at uh, sorry with accessibility and higher education. We're going to talk about specifically how accessibility affects our collections because I figured there would be some people coming who weren't just dealing with like instruction and um, web design and accessibility and we're also going to talk about how it affects our collections um, specifically looking at e-resource and VPATs. And then we're going to talk about some new uh, UNCG resources about accessibility. And I believe that this should leave us with plenty of time that if y'all have questions or specific things related to your job and accessibility that we want to talk about or need to talk about, um, let me know. So the first thing would be, um, I'm sure y'all are very used to this, um, a poll. So um, here is a direct link to a question. I just want to see kind of like make sure we're all, not make sure, see where we're all at with um, thinking about accessibility. You can also um, pull up your phone and go to www.minty.com and uh, fill out this uh, code, 9610-2317. So that's what it should look like. Okay, so the question that I'm asking is what do you think is the biggest challenge with accessibility and your job and someone pointed out unseen disabilities. Yes, we're going to talk a little bit about that and um, strategies to think through. Um, so someone said not all the material that come to our digital repositories are accessible. Yes, we're going to talk about e resources and particularly online content um, and uh, some free tools online that we can check, um, but also again who at UNCG can help with a lot of these different issues that we uh, face. So someone said physical access to materials at time and cursive. Yes. <laughs> so, and as, as an archivist, you, students can't read cursive sometimes. Yeah. Um, I used to work in archives um, and uh, yeah, that handwriting deal and uh, getting it text readable, right? When y'all are digitizing, yeah. that was like a huge thing I had to deal with was digitizing materials and like trying to get it text readable. And you're like, man, that handwriting. <laughs> Well, actually, over the pandemic, Erin had a project with getting the McKeever papers, which she promoted, but getting the McKeever papers to be transcribed uh, because of that, the fact that they're cursive, and so we get them put in text, it helps people read them, because otherwise, wow, if you don't have cursive, cool that's a, just, I mean, I say disability, but it is a challenge, Yeah, you know, mainly students, but still people in the world, it's, it can be, cursive is a hard thing to read sometimes. Yes, definitely, I agree, yeah, like, you know, um, and then someone here said receiving and applying closed captions to streaming documentaries, the library purchases that we host through box. 
Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, closed captioning is a huge one. Um, and I'm glad I did this poll. I was kind of like, oh, well, it's a smaller group, so maybe I shouldn't do it. But I think like a nice thing, not, you know, I mean, a cool thing about the polling is um, I can kind of see, we can see that we all, depending on where we are, deal with accessibility as a part of our job in different ways. So some of us, again, are dealing with patrons and thinking about them coming up, um, you know, and making sure we're giving them the best. Some of us are talking about teaching. Some of us are talking about the collections. Like um, I'm thinking of what Michelle said here about this uh, applying closed captioning and what Sean mentioned in terms of applying text readable, um, having a grant that made paper, you know, archival papers text readable. Um, yeah. And then even like uh, our digital repository, right? Thinking about how we make uh, our research accessible or our faculty's research accessible. Great. This is useful. Thank you all for uh, uh, playing along with my poll. Don't always get out of it. Okay, so we're going to start by just kind of going over the basics of accessibility and making sure like we're, we all are on the same page about um, why it's important. And again, I think a lot of y'all have been to sessions on accessibility before, so we're going to go pretty fast through this and then y'all can just ask me questions or we can stop and focus. Um, and as you all brought up, right, is that um, accessibility is about, um, you know, making our materials accessible, making how we interact with patrons accessible, making how we teach accessible, but it also is about creating a more inclusive teaching and work environment, right? So when we create accessible materials, when we are helping people um, using accessible techniques, right, we're, we're really adding to uh, the importance of feeling included, right, inclusive uh, spaces. So accessible is a uh, means a person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a patron without a disability in an equally effective and equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. Right. So um, a slide that I use a lot in my accessibility teaching is that slide where it's like people looking at the um, baseball fields, right? And you say equal, but you're, so you're giving them all one box, but it, it doesn't have them like able to look over the fence to see the baseball game. But then equity would be providing them the, what they need to be able to actually see the game. And then um, true like equity and liberation for inclusive environment would be getting rid of the fence, right? <laughs> um, and not even having to uh, prop uh, people up in different ways. But um, I didn't include that because we don't necessarily have time, but this is, I think, to me, a great definition because it talks about, again, this idea of that um, we're, in, we're having e equity with materials and with our services um, in, in a very, you know, in integrative way. So universal design for learning is usually brought up when we're talking about our teaching and how we interact with people, whether you're like teaching for um, uh, your job or for a presentation or you're designing a website or you're um, creating any kind of interaction like online through Zoom. So um, universal design for learning um, is a method of um, engaging learners for um, multiple different types of engagement representation and action and expression. And then I have some ways it can go further, um, right, by providing options for recruiting interest, sustaining effort and persistence and self-regulation, providing options for perception, language and symbols and comprehension, and providing options for physical action, expression and communication and executive functions. So really a lot of what this means is that you should never really do be doing one type of um, lecture, one type of interaction. Uh, so if you're teaching a course, right, you would want to engage your students in a lot of different ways. And the nice thing about UDL is that it really looks at accessibility very holistically, like someone in the poll brought up unseen disabilities. Um, a lot of times when you talk about accessibility, people are thinking like, oh, well, we're talking about someone with like a visual impairment or a hearing impairment. But um, one of the largest uh, disability uh, not claims, but uh, things that students are putting down when they go through the Office of Accessibility and Resources is actually neurodivergent, um, except, you know, uh, disabilities. So such as uh, ADD or ADHD, or again, any kind of thing which maybe makes them view the world in a neuro neurodivergent lens. So UDL allows us to kind of engage our patrons and our students, right, thinking through that there's not really one right way to do things. Um, you know, there's a lot of accessible ways to engage people have 
different representation and different action expression. So um, again, I didn't want to like harp on UDL. I feel like um, y'all have probably heard me talk about UDL a lot. I really like UDL, but if something is, um, if you are interested in learning more about UDL, there is this really great article um, about going beyond UDL to create equitable um, spaces within our um, learning and teaching. It's called equitable, but not diverse. Universal design for learning is not enough. So again, this idea of like creating an accessible space is important, but really creating an inclusive space is ideal. So if you're interested in this, um, I work with Amanda and um, Dominique um, in my work uh, through ACRL and research. I've presented with them a couple of times. They're great. This is a really great article. Highly recommend if y'all are y'all are into learning more about that kind of stuff. So um, here's some other accessibility concepts, um, right? So a big thing that I talk about a lot and that when you go to accessibility presentations is that um, why does accessibility matter? So I'm not gonna harp on this as much because I feel like we're, we're far enough into a pandemic that y'all know why it matters. Um, but just to bring up some important points beyond what I've already talked about, right? Like access, you know, disability is not always visual, right? It's not always immediately clear who we're helping needs um, these kind of accessibility accommodations. But, um, you know, again, the way to view that would be if you create a completely accessible online environment, um, an accessible teaching environment, then you're helping everyone, right? It's like there's a, a famous graphic of like, you know, a wheelchair ramp, right? A wheelchair ramp helps more than people who are just in wheelchairs. It makes the whole space um, open up better. And that's, again, that universal design in terms of architecture as well applies there. Um, so there's other statistics too. Um, I have them in the notes of this um, document if people wanted to read it. Um, but I think they're good if you ever need them for advocacy about the importance of accessibility. But stuff like one in four of today's 20-year-olds will become disabled before reaching the age of 67. About 56.7 million people or 19% of the United States identified themselves as having a disability on the 2010 census. Um, we would assume that number has actually gone up since 2010, and more than half um, identified their disability as severe. And then a male U.S. worker at the age of 35 faces a one in five chance of a disability, taking him off of a job for 90 days or longer. And a 35-year-old woman reaches retirement age before uh, she faces a nearly one in three risk of a disability lasting at least 90 days. Um, but of course, like all things, um, you know, statistics about disabilities can be hard to pin down. Um, and a lot of times, especially in a high higher education environment when we're thinking about our students. Um, a lot of students do not disclose their disability because again, remember a lot of disabilities can be to do with neurodivergent stuff and they think they don't have um, the right to disclose it to an office of accessibility, but of course they can. Uh, but again, that means we don't really even know how many um, disabled uh, patrons we might be helping or interacting with at UNCG at any given time. So um, another thing to think about in terms of accessibility that's brought up a lot is ADA compliance. Accessibility is the law. It's a law for us to provide equal access to our materials, whether it's collection wise or um, with our teaching um, or with presentations we give at conferences or anything like that. So WCAG 2.1 is really important. It stands for um, Web Compliance Accessibility Guidelines, that's it. Um, and this is a link out to their website if y'all wanna look at it. I like their website, it's very accessible and I think really easy to use, um, but it gives this nice introduction and then um, differences between the different things. Um, it goes through why, you know, why web accessibility is important. And then there are different um, points of it where you actually can go into the standards. And then if you're like, oh, what do I want with time-based media to make sure it's accessible? And they give you these examples, um, they give you links out to all these link out to definitions and then what you can do to be more accessible in that way. Um, so Jenny said, Sam, this is making me think I need to have you come to the Disability Honor Society group. Yes, definitely. I would be happy to. As you all know, I love talking about accessibility. Um, so WCAG 2.1 is, you know, really important. Like when we ever, like when we were interviewing for the accessibility coordinator position, I was on that search committee. And a lot of what we talked about was um, making sure that our online stuff was adhering to these standards. So if you ever are in a conference presentation or if you're thinking through your own website design, online materials, this is what we're usually talking about, right? Um, and of course, you can go down here and see there's a lot of stuff to think about. Uh, when we're making stuff online. But again, I, I really like these, the way they've um, put these standards online. Because again, if you're like, I don't understand what you mean by language of parts, you can just go and click on it and they 
ex tell you exactly what they mean. And then if you're like, I don't know what you mean by programmatically determined, they give you the definition and they give you notes about how um, to make sure that your web design is accessible in that way. So inclusive design is what we kind of talked about a lot with uh, universal design. Um, and there is this nice website that if you want to go more into inclusive course design, if you're making like research modules or you're making a video or anything like that, um, it goes again beyond what we're talking about in terms of like making sure your materials kind of are a checklist of like have closed captioning, have alt text, have tables, have things like that. Um, it also talks about again, representation, diversity, equity, and inclusion within your course design as well. So if that's something you want to learn about more, there's a link. Um, we've already talked about universal design for learning, and there's a link out to CAST, which is one of the largest websites about UDL, if you want to learn more about that. Um, but I do want to point out that I did link to the UDL guidelines, um, which they're actually improving by doing a UDL rising to equity initiative to make it more um, uh, equitable, to make it more like EDI focused in terms of how they do it. So if you want to learn more about that project, uh, you can get involved or read about it. But this is a kind of like rubric like take of how to apply UDL, again, to a website, uh, tutorial, uh, web, you know, uh, course design, uh, teaching, anything like that, where again, they give you these specific examples where if you're like, I really want to do better with providing multiple means of representation, you can go down and see the different categories and then specific things you can do, right? Like support decoding of text, um, promote understanding across languages, illustrate through multiple media, and more. Um, so I use this a lot. Um, I I like this rubric. Um, I've even seen projects where people take their um, course design, their videos, their whatever they're making, their online learning objects, and kind of test it by this rubric, right? Like a checklist type of thing. I think it's kind of an interesting technique. Um, so keep that in mind. That is linked there as well. Um, so just a couple of disclaimers at the end, of the kind of the intro section, right? We've already talked about this. Y'all brought it up in the polling. Disabilities are not always what you think. Um, we already talked about this. Many people do not disclose disabilities, including students. Um, and we already talked about, again, this idea of, uh, you know, being uh, careful, um, as well as particularly bias um, when it comes to how we look at disability um, within studies or the media or anything like that. Um, and again, y'all kind of talked about this, but I kind of wanted to think because I thought maybe again, there would be a lot of different people here. Um, but again, all these different ways it affects our jobs, right? So library collections, technology, um, presentations that we're giving like here in UVLC um, and beyond um, instruction and reference. So um, some key components of accessibility when we're talking about online stuff, whether you're making a website, um, maybe whether you're making a video and more, are things that y'all kind of mentioned, right? Like Sean mentioned um, text readability of the archival papers, right? Um, so anything that's put online, a screen reader needs to be able to read it. Um, this also includes when you're presenting or um, going through things, contrast as well as uh, colors, and we're thinking through uh, color blindness, right? Like making sure people who don't see colors the same way that you see colors can read it as well. Um, so alt text is when you can put um, uh, on an image or multimedia where if you are visually impaired, right, your screen reader would be able to read what the image or multimedia is. And then tables are important in terms of screen readers as well. Um, and one thing I forgot to put on here is also um, in terms of uh, disability and uh, motor functioning, a lot of times people can can't use a mouse or need to use a mouse, um, right? So your material also has to be able to be able to work with or without a mouse, right? Like just from um, scrolling in that way. Um, so I forgot to add that tabbing. Thanks, Josh. I, I think Josh, you were a web designer, right? So like you can talk about this stuff as well, um, tabbing, exactly. And that's again a lot of stuff to do also with hyperlinks. So if you hear people talk about how like hyperlinks can't open in certain ways uh, to do with accessibility, that's what they're talking about. And then of course, what y'all mentioned, like I think Michelle mentioned her project with uh, having to close caption videos. Um, closed captioning is a huge one. It's a very time consuming one. Um, and there's um, our technology for how we close caption video has gotten a lot better um, over the last couple of years. Um, but you know, it's still very time consuming and hard. Um, in terms of that stuff. Okay, so now we're going to talk about e-resources. There are some of y'all, um, yeah, still has a long way to go. It's better, but not perfect, as Michelle knows. Um, so now we're going to talk about accessibility and e-resources, and I'm glad, you know, a couple of y'all are from technical services, so definitely let me know, and I think, oh, Catherine, you're here. I won't, uh, 
put you on the spot or anything, but if Catherine, you want to talk about anything new that I've missed, I was just going to go over a quick overview of accessibility and e-resources. And a big thing when we talk about our collections, right, how we negotiate with our vendors is that we use something called VPATS, Voluntary Product Accessibility accessibility template. And it's a document that explains how information and communication technology products such as software, hardware, electronic content and support documentation meet or conform to the revised 508 standards for IT accessibility. And the revised 508 standards are ADA compliance. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the legality of having ADA compliance. So VPATs help federal agency contracting officials and government buyers to assess ICT for accessibility when doing market research and evaluating proposals. So what that means is that for us as a library, that's what we use, right, when we're negotiating these contracts, these licenses uh, with vendors when we're getting our materials. Um, so here's where this comes from. It's um, actually a whole uh, website on uh, VPATS. And then this website here leads you to more on section uh, 508 um, in terms of contracts, if you're interested. So here's a screenshot of some um, examples of how library um, vendor VPATS and accessibility statements um, come. So this was taken, you know, a couple of years ago, um, like I think to around 2019. So you can see here they could be dated and I'm sure a lot of these um, companies have more updated VPATs, um, you know, from the last couple of years, especially where we were all so online all the time. Um, but this can be a useful way to look um, at if a company has a VPAT in just terms of a VPAT repository, even if it's not 100% up to date. Um, but you know, you can kind of do it that way. Um, a lot of times websites also have um, VPATs attached to it. So like, for example, EBSCO, if you go to EBSCO's website, and you go to their accessibility page, they have their VPAT and their accessibility statement. Um, together. So you can see here there are it's different. An accessibility statement means you're like committed to accessibility, whereas a VPAT again is more um, of a of like adding to your contract, I think. I think that's the difference. And again, if I'm Heather, you're welcome to correct me if I'm wrong. I think what um, you're so saying is accurate, but I have to be honest that um, I never this never comes up when we're doing licenses. Um, it, it's like something it's almost like I this is not on this level, but it almost seems a little to me like virtue signaling on the part of the vendors that they have this posted and they've gone through the process to identify it and make it look like it, but it's never um, in any of the uh, contracts I've ever seen been something that they um, acknowledge um, or that we would fight for or that we would say you need to do this or, or we're not going to, because there's nothing um, it's really rare that we would even have the leverage to say like you have to do this or we're not buying it. and they'll be like okay well i guess yeah not buying it. yeah so I it's, know it's that there, but i'm not sure the impact it's really having on like the contracting process versus on the consumer and who wants to like make an effort and so i'm not i don't know i'm kind of unsure of its true impact i guess yeah i think that um Something that I mean, I've heard from, you know, e resources librarians um, and uh, Catherine, you can uh, tell me what you think is that like when what I'm hearing you say too is like we're kind of at the mercy of vendors right like we don't have a lot of wiggle room to be like we're taking a stand. Um, until you fix this we can't get you right because we have to give our patrons what they want. I almost said customers and I know we're not supposed to say that patrons what they want. Um, but saying that, like, at least if we have, um, you know, language, uh, if we have like the knowledge of the of the vendors who are kind of doing a worse job, right, mm -hmm. then, then that's a good thing um, as yeah. well. I mean, I think it could come down to perhaps someday when we are experiencing like a massive cut to our products, like we could reward content providers who do this. I mean, that would yeah. be a way that we could assert some kind of power and then we could tell them why. And yeah. then, you know, um, but as far as like whether or not like it, it's in the contract language, it's very toothless. Um, at yeah. This point. And I know we used to write into our contracts that we would sign um, stuff about accessibility. Um, I don't know if we still do that, where it would say we were putting it kind of back on them. Do we yeah. still do that? It's the, It can be there. So sometimes I'll ask for stuff, but a lot of times <laughs> the things that I need them to take out, you know, you got to choose your battles. <laughs> and there are some other things that they try to put in that I can't 
probably even get UNCG legal to agree to. So again, that's why it kind of gets put on the side and it's kind of sad because it would be great if it had more um, power behind it. Yeah, yeah. So I think like going off of that, there's, I guess all we can really do is like have knowledge of who's doing a good job and who's not doing a good job. Um, and this link right here was a huge project put on um, by the Big Ten Academic Alliance where they, they actually paid vendors to go through and do an accessibility audit of, um, you know, our large vendors. So they paid like accessibility, like what like experts to come in and check all of our big vendors um, and, uh, you know, kind of write this report right in terms of how people are doing. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, you can see and you can go into the testing and see how they tested um, and then the um, also the accessibility evaluations and the responses. Uh, so you could go down here and see like EBSCO, um, they wrote the letter and how it went and what their response was, what they were going to do about the issues. So this is kind of, again, I think a nice thing in terms of what Catherine's talking about and that as an individual library, there's not much we can do. We have to work within legal. We have to do all this stuff. But this like alliance, right, paid these outside people to do these like audits. So now we, again, at least have the knowledge where if we could uh, get more power, if we at least to let them know to uh, go on that kind of way. So this is interesting, especially if you have like specific issues with the vendor, uh, you could go in here and see what the audit report said. And they did do this audit using uh, WCAG 2.1, or maybe at the time it was 2.0, uh, but 2.1 um, and did it that way. So this is an interesting project if y'all are interested in it and linked there. Um, some other things to keep in mind, um, you know, what Catherine was saying, what we were talking about, you could write in accessibility language in your contracts and licensing agreements. Um, there are um, licensing resource links where they go through guides and tools about, again, even beyond um, accessibility, copyright things. So if you were just getting started um, with uh, negotiating these kind of things, understanding it, as well as laws and organizations that can help you with licensing in that way. Um, and this article right here, it's a scholarly article, which gives example of accessibility language within a library file license. Um, and they did an accessibility audit on their e-resources um, in terms of how accessible is our collection performing an e-resources accessibility review, um, review audit. Um, and then they, um, again, changed the way they do their contract licenses based on the study, um, which I find pretty interesting. And it's from American University. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is talk about like these UNCG specific resources and I don't think it's going to take that long so then we should have plenty of time to uh, talk about other stuff or have questions or anything like that. Um, so, and again I'm watching the chat so just let me know if you have any questions concerns. Um, so I've kind of talked about this throughout but there's a lot of people at UNCG working on accessibility so we have ORS, it's ORS with an S, I should have uh, put that I can change that right now, this is a nice thing about um doing it doing it live i can just fix it so we have ORS, which is the office of accessibility and resources so this is where students would go to declare an accessibility i feel like i'm not saying that right but to declare a disability right to get accessibility accommodations so for example if they need screen readers if they need um, a aid in classes um, to uh, help them read or anything like that they would go through ORS. so one thing about ORS to keep in mind and i'll say this in a recording and i don't think it's a big deal but they are really more about face to face they don't really deal a lot with online accessibility right so they're really again um, how they would help you like print out materials in larger text um, for visual issues they would um, help you again have an aid if you needed someone to like be with you in class to read the captioning um, live that kind of thing but they're not really meant for again these online courses online tutorials anything like that so based on that based on that they're really more about face to face UNCG online years ago, I think I, I think it was like around four years ago, three years ago, hired an accessibility coordinator. Her name is Mil Melanie Ely. Um, and she um, has, um, you know, taken over in terms of online accessibility at UNCG. So because of her, um, there was a website made, which we're going to go over in a second. And she is also the head designer of the course. So she had some people under her who are helping with a lot of stuff, has had some grants um, through UNCG where they will close caption stuff. Um, and Michelle, we can talk about this 
after, but um, I years ago tried to get them to help us with closed captioning in terms of all the materials we made for patrons where we would have to kind of go in and caption stuff with our tutorials. Um, you know, again, like that, what you're talking about where we have to put something in box to do with copyright. Um, and at the time, years ago, I was shot down, um, but maybe it's time that we can try again, <laughs> right? Um, and then one thing at, UN at UNCG is that anyone teaching online does have something called professional development requirements. And here I'm calling them PD requirements. Um, and they have to keep them up to date. Um, and a part of that is going through a lot of training, which could include stuff about, of course, instructional technology, or it also could include about accessibility. Um, so if we click on this and link out to it, um, it's through the provost office, but it tells you the purpose of the professional development requirements. And this is going to be a huge part of SAC COC, which is coming up, right, in terms of making sure that we are properly training people who are teaching online to create accessible um, online courses, as well as uh, delivering things accessibly for students, whether face to face or online, but this is really about online. So here this links out to a lot of things in terms of resources, um, professional development opportunities that y'all can do that we can do, um, you know, staff, faculty, uh, librarians, any kind of status can do this stuff to get more prepared in that. Um, also, faculty who are teaching online or instructors who are teaching online can, if they don't want to do any of these options, uh, go through alternative documentation, where basically if you go to a conference or anything like that, you have to fill out a form and work with your um, academic ITC or um, department chair program director to say, I did this thing, I don't need to do the other three options here. So, um, and then continuing things are quality matters, which I think a couple of y'all in here have done those workshops, um, meeting one on one with your academic ITC or going to their training. Um, there's all these online learning level courses. Um, I think they haven't added in this course. Oh, they have. And then web accessibility 101, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and then more. So it goes through all of this stuff. It's really long, I'm like realizing. But if y'all are interested in that, that is linked there. Um, and then I think y'all all know this, but every academic department has at least one ITC or instructional technology consultant. Um, and we are UNCG, a quality matters school, which quality matters is a rubric that you can apply to your course design and teaching, uh, mostly course design uh, that goes through a lot of different things um, in terms of how you could be of course accessible as well as um, inclusive in how you design it um, it's always like really hard to get to the actual rubric because it's like copyrighted and hidden behind all these walls sometimes you can find one that just says like copyrighted over and over but i guess can't even do that anymore um, but uncg has this rubric elsewhere if you wanted to look at it but this is what it is and this is what they're trying to do with it um so that's again just some resources and the people that I work with in terms of all the different things, um, offices, services that we offer in terms of accessibility. So here's some free stuff uh, that I have found really useful. Canvas within the course has a built in. Um, accessibility checker within the rich content editor, which is how you add content to Canvas. It's called You Do It, I'm pretty confident. And then you just push a button and it will go through your pages and then tell you what's accessible and not accessible. Um, Google Slides has something similar. It's a Google Slide add-on. It's called Brackle Slides. Um, if you want to uh, mess around with your Google Slides and make sure they're accessible. Um, and then what I usually do and look at websites or anything I put online, which this works on Google Sites and it also works on LibGuides, is that there is the wave accessibility checker uh, where you just throw in a web page and it will show you what's going on. Um, so I'll throw in um, quality matters. We'll we'll test them. And then it pulls up the web page and it will go through um, all the stuff, right? And it will show you the issues with it. It's usually, again, these kind of like icons that maybe people forget to put like the headers, the wrappers around thing. Um, and then the rest, it will show you if you click on it, if you're like, what do you mean by this? It will click on it. It says that that means that they're doing a good job. Something's present. And then here they did something bad with a header, no header, but then this one says there's a header. So it's not always like easy to use. You kind of have to get used to it, but it does kind of show you these like basic uh, issues. Like maybe they skipped a heading level. Maybe there's a contrast. I see contrast issues a lot when I use this and more. It's a nice useful tool to kind of get an idea of basic accessibility issues with um, websites. Low contrast again is a big one, big one. 
So there's also a bunch of Chrome extensions that can help you with accessibility stuff in terms of if patrons ask you about it or your own in terms of understanding what people with different uh, differing abilities might be going through. So read out loud, right? Um, all kinds of things. Google Translate and more. So check that out. And then there's also a free screen reader that's usually recommended. And when we do train uh, training on screen readers, we usually do it on this, but it's called ND Access NBDA. And again, you can download it onto your computer for free and experience how people who cannot see or have uh, extreme visual um, impairments go through online content, which can be useful to make sure that your content um, works in that way. Okay, so um, the two big things that we have at UNCG is that we have a UNCG accessibility website that includes um, information about accessibility, inclusivity, policies and guidelines and making content accessible, and then a help and request page in terms of who to contact when you have these accessibility issues. Uh, so if you haven't checked it out, I definitely recommend it. It's accessibility.uncg.edu. They've kept it really well updated during COVID. <coughs> You're welcome to email me, you know, but you also can just you know, go on here and put in help and request. Um, Jenny knows like I will email Melanie about things and she's usually pretty quick to respond. So like once we made a video with no narration, <coughs> so we were like, oh, how would we, do we need to do closed captioning? How do we do it? You know, in terms of people who couldn't see it, right? Cause there's no narration to closed caption. Um, and she advised us on how we could like type out what's happening and like have it in a Google doc and attach that to the um, Google, to the YouTube channel in that way. So keep that in mind. And then um, more stuff. So if you haven't checked this out, I definitely recommend it. I like this area here, making content accessible, because you can go down here and be like, yes, I am making a website um, and click on this. And they'll tell you again, these main issues that come up, um, these main things that you can do when you're creating multimedia. Um, you can jump down if you're like, yeah, I just want to learn more about captioning, um, the options we have at UNCG, why it's important, who benefits, and then resources on how things work. And then here's the requesting captions on our transcripts from a vendor. Again, we do have money where um, things can be made in this way, but the last time I checked, it was just for academic courses. But again, Michelle, maybe we should recheck, try again. Uh, there's, there's a new provost, so who knows? Okay, so the big thing too that I wanted to kind of show y'all today, um, and I think I sent an email out, um, you know, what is, what is time uh, this week about the new UNCG Web Accessibility 101. So this is a new course through Canvas on web accessibility. Um, it's asynchronous. They're saying it should take you around four to eight hours. Um, I have it, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, it's my project in December to go through it and do it. But if you feel pretty confident about web accessibility, the idea from what I understand and from looking at it, we're gonna look at it in a second, um, is that you do have, um, if you're like pretty comp, you can skip ahead and go straight to the quizzes, right? And then it might not take you up to four hours, right? Like if you already are kind of like, oh, I know a good amount about closed captioning, you can just skip ahead to the quiz and take it. And then you can take the quiz over and over again. Um, so keep it in mind. As of right now, it is not required. It's heavily recommended with anyone working with online content at UNCG. And um, just, you know, I've said this to a couple people over the last week. It's not required right now, but it might be. Um, and their rumor is that it's definitely going to probably be required for anyone that deals with website stuff um, within the next year. And they're saying probably by the summer, it might be required for anyone teaching online uh, to go through those professional development requirements that I went over. So again, if you if there's even like kind of a thought in your mind <laughs> that you might be teaching online or really working with websites a lot, you might as well go ahead and do it. Again, to me, this is going to be a December project for me, you know, right when students go away. Um, it could be a summer project, you know, if you need that, like whatever, um, however your academic year kind of works. Um, but you can self-enroll here if you haven't already enrolled. Um, I'm already enrolled, so I'm going to click here and we're going to view the course real fast. Um, so it is very accessible. <laughs> it has a lot of what you're going to be doing. Um, and then these are going to be what's coming. So one question I've gotten a lot the last couple of weeks is like, can I skip ahead to level two? No, you have to have done level one. And then they would say, okay, you feel like you're good with level one. Here's level two. 
here's level three. Um, so uh, that's going to be how it is. So of course, I don't think level two or level three will ever be required, though I do think eventually level one will be required. Um, because as you can see from the description, we're really talking about like complex visuals, graphs, charts, tables, and level two. And then level three, I think you're really also thinking about, um, here they're talking about accessible forms, PDFs, um, and then code. I think they're really going to go into the code and how you make website design more accessible. So again, if uh, it depends on what you're looking for, but then um, they have the syllabus here of how it works, right? Course objectives, all the things. Um, one thing to keep in mind, I meant to say on this homepage, is that this is adapted from a Creative Commons open course. So cool, they did open Commons, so you know, right? And they put the CC license in there. I was, I was proud of them. I was like, good job, UNCG Online. Um, Okay, so then you can go through, you can see it is not, you can skip, but it does show you like complete all items. But like, if you're like, oh, I'm really good. Like, I don't really need to go through the welcome. You can just, you know, blaze through it and touch it. Um, every single one has a read about, watch about and explore type thing where they're not all 100% um, necessary, right? You can kind of pick and choose what works for you and what you think is the most useful. Um, so like you don't necessarily have to watch every single video, right? Or explore. Um, and this is just, again, showing us how it's all gonna work. And then they have links to Canvas. Um, so you just keep going. Why is this important? And so on and so on. And again, you can see, you can kind of skip through and make it work for you. So if you go back here, you can see what I've already gone through right with y'all um, and then keep going. So you can, um, like I said, you, you can't skip ahead to the end, but you can of course go through it quickly, if that makes sense. Are there any questions, concerns? So here's the videos, how they look with the actual content in it. Hidden birth. so again, a lot of good stuff in here. So if you haven't already done it, I mean, there's there's no like penalty also for enrolling, like right now we're enrolling and not touching it for like six months, a year, never. Um, so I do recommend if you're even like interested in this to go ahead and self enroll because then it's, you know, an org in your um, Canvas course and you can just go to it later. So like, you know, because I'm the online learning librarian, I'm um, enrolled in a lot of classes like potentially like a hundred, right? But if I still, because I'm enrolled in this class, I can now just go, and type in web accessibility and go down and open it up if I need to reference something or like get going um, with doing it in the um, in December or spring that kind of thing. Okay, and that's it. I know Jenny has to go soon, but I did want to have some time for questions, and I left us fifteen minutes. If y'all have questions, concerns. You want 15 minutes back that's fine too but i definitely wanted to leave time for questions so. Did, um i was late as i'm fine. guessing the impetus behind this from the university is they're revamping the web pages like is that yeah so actually this was done by um uncg online accessibility coordinator who was hired with um years ago pre-pandemic with the idea that uncg was increasing their online presence right but then we also still needed to be ada compliant right so we were teaching more classes but we weren't necessarily providing more training right and then again particularly in the pandemic we quickly put things online but um there's been a lot of questions as y'all can imagine um in the last couple Couple of years about how accessible is all this stuff we're putting online um, quickly without much training, right? So this really more came from that. Um, there is, of course, stuff on here about website design, um, and that is a part of it as well. So I think it's the twofold thing. Um, but when I've been to trainings about this um, and heard um, Melanie Ely and Miranda Lim, one of the instructional technologists over at UNCG Online, speak about this, um, they really actually mostly speak about this in terms of like online instruction. Um, but again, yeah, Yes, the rumor is that it will eventually be required to go through this course for anyone who works deeply within the website um, and not. One thing about the website, and I wish, I'm trying to look if anyone's here who I can be like, hello, like um, like Terry or someone. Um, but like the website deal is that I think a lot of that's being done through vendors. And then we go in and like kind of, I don't want to say clean it up, but like work it for us. And I think, again, 
I know we're being recorded. I don't feel like anyone will potentially make it this far into the recording, but I think it's been a lot, a lot. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of issues. Um, so again, I think this would help with that um, if you do anything with web design, which I feel like, you know, um, my husband is a uh, funeral director. And like the other day we were laughing at like a job description of like putting things online. I was like, that's everyone's job. Like everyone has to put stuff online now. <laughs> like, yeah. You know. Um, so anyway, yeah. yes, I think it's both the the increase in online instruction uh, mm -hmm. and it happened quickly with with not enough training, right? Because we were we're we're still in a pandemic, um, and then um, then also the website. So a, a two, we're, we're having a lot going on <laughs> with all, it's online. It's twofold. Stuff. Yeah, I was yes, just yes. curious. In yeah, my last sure. program, um, I believe it was Dr. Chow, um, but he had us look at the, uh, the School of Ed's website and compare it with, I don't know, the departmental website or something. And there were some, um, like some overlaps, some incongruities, I don't know. I really don't love navigating UNCG web pages. I'm just gonna be honest about that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that they're doing a, a multi-pronged approach to fixing both the yeah. accessibility component and the experience component because sometimes yeah. it's hard again, to find information and like terry i think is a huge um uh, terry bransma is like a huge contact for us in terms of the, the website revamp so i don't really feel like i can speak to it um that much but again i think a lot of it is being done through like an outside um vendor um, okay. so I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think there's like positives and negatives to that. I would assume, right. In that, like, we can be like, y'all make it accessible. <laughs> um, but then I think again, the idea of this training would be like, we will maintain it after the vendor leaves. Right. So like, uh, as we're adding content, you know, right. And then I think for us as librarians, like, you know, we have, we have found loopholes into making websites, um, as well as like, hooking to that, like making a website is easier than ever before. So like, I know like the DMC helps students make websites, you know, there's been projects that like I've worked on with information literacy stuff where like students are making websites. Um, so again, just this increase in online content and instructions. Yeah, Michelle just did that great uh, session about uh, BTS, um, our version of BTS, not the band, um, going through new Google sites, you know, and again, it's so easy to use. I mean, Michelle kind of talks about that in her stuff. It's like so easy to use, which is positive. Uh, but then it's like, yeah, we can talk about the band too. Yeah. I'm, I'm here for it. I'm here for all of it. So yeah, that was a good question. Um, I did not talk about that at the beginning. Um, Juanita, all you missed at the beginning was just like intro to accessibility 101. So yeah, great question. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Sam, uh, so I, I'm i coming to this from like a, the web development background. Yeah, definitely. Um, but not with online instruction. Mm -hmm. And my sense has always been that these, these things, people are always trying to, to move in that direction and say, I'm accessible. But uh, it's hard to even know what counts as you're accessible or you're not accessible. And then there's a variety of standards, including that w, uh, WC3 standards, which have A, AA, AAA. And do you have to meet all of those or are you not accessible? Um, and and I guess I guess I'm I'm it, that's my interest in this, and I'm I suppose I'm wondering like how how is the the university going to make sure that um, well what what's the standard the university is going to have for that is it is it the W is it the WC three or yeah, so WCAG 2.1, from what I understand, is going off of W3C. So I think a lot of times when we're talking about using uh, WCAG 2.1 to like check our online stuff, we're talking about W3C. Um, so Melanie Ely, you know, the web accessibility coordinator that I uh, have uh, talked about, was hired to attach instruction and uh, web content to ICT, which is the higher education um, kind of uh, agreement, right, about that. So I'm, I'm pulling it up. Um, so many tabs um, from that accessibility site. So I'm going to share my screen. So that's a lot of what that course is about, Josh, you know, in terms of kind of getting us all on the same page. And I think again, um, and I'm not sure about how we assess it and how we kind of check it, 
right? But this is what I, it's the ICT web accessibility policy. Um, and I think Richard um, worked on that, Richard Cox. So um, just took me to the same website. Oh, here it is. Um, so this is the policy and it was just revised in um, 2019. I think Richard was on the revision committee, um, but this goes through the definitions and the roles and responsibilities and what we are done. And you can see here with the, um, they link out to electronic and information technology standards, policies. So does this help? Yeah, I think I just saw where you put uh, up above there, like a two uh, double A, um, which is interesting because you're basically saying the AAA ones are not um, things you have to hit. Yeah. And I think, again, a, a good a person who's better at this in terms of the website, well, you know, I to me, like I usually when I'm like presenting and researching accessibility, it's really to do with instruction. Um, I don't feel like I'm an expert on web accessibility. And I think there's overlaps, right? Like we use WCAG 2.0, like W3C, you know, to like think through how we're putting stuff online. Um, and I think it's really useful, but like, you know, like what Josh is saying, it the coding and like how it goes and how the, the standards, there's different ones, like what are the rules? That to me, a good person to talk to would be uh, Richard and um, Terry who do more stuff with our like website design and work within UNCG and legal and, and the policies to kind of connect the dots. But that web accessibility 101 uh, creation, another part of that was to adhere to the ICT policies of saying we're doing our best to train faculty staff um, on um, how to make the most accessible content for our students, for our patrons at all time. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, y'all have had good questions. I'm excited. Anything else? And again, Catherine is here and Catherine is our amazing e-resources librarian, as you all know, and could ask, you can ask her questions about e-resources and accessibility. We're all experts in different ways. I'm seeing people have to go and that's totally fine. I get it. I'll see some of y'all in a ROI meeting in a couple of minutes. Anything else before I close the room and let you all have a little bit of a break before whatever your 2 p.m. is? Well, thanks for coming y'all. Um, thanks for your great questions, um, great things. Um, See you all soon. Have a great day. Great weekend if I don't see you all tomorrow. Bye.